Bigfoot Classified contains content that is graphic in nature and listener discretion is advised. Bigfoot Classified relies largely on news documents, eyewitness accounts, press conferences, and interviews. Every episode is produced with respect to the victims, families, and communities involved. Some of the interviews, quotes, and broadcasts have been recreated. Numerous hours of research have been done regarding these stories. And if you have a theory, question, or feel that we've missed something, we encourage you to visit BigfootClassified.com. Bigfoot, also commonly referred to as Sasquatch, is a purported ape-like creature said to inhabit the forests of North America. This is Bigfoot Classified. Three days after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in southwest Washington state, imponderables dust the air like volcanic ash. Ten persons are known dead, 71 are missing, and one estimate is that it will take more than $150 million just for road and bridge repair. It is an event that defies superlatives. One geologist said today, there is no record in geology in the last 4,000 years of anything like this happening before. The tremendous lateral blast is unprecedented. Mount St. Helens, which stands in Skamania County, Washington, is not just known for its disastrous eruption in 1980, during which almost 60 people and thousands of animals lost their lives. The area's history is full of strange stories and reports of ape-like creatures, one of the most famous ones dating back to 1924. Mount St. Helens is located in the Cascade Range, southwestern Washington, being one of the several lofty volcano peaks that dominate the range that extends from Mount Gerbali in British Columbia, Canada, to Lassen Peak in Northern California. It lies 52 miles northeast of Portland, Oregon, and 98 miles south of Seattle. The modern name Mount St. Helens was given by a seafarer and explorer, Captain George Vancouver of the British Royal Navy in 1792. The name was meant as an honor to a fellow countryman who held the title Baron St. Helens and who was at the time the British ambassador to Spain. Captain George Vancouver also named three other volcanoes in the Cascades, Mount Baker, Hood, and Rainier. According to geologists, Mount St. Helens is a composite volcano, or stratovolcano, a term used for steep-sided, often symmetrical cones constructed of alternating layers of lava flows, ash, and other volcanic debris. Due to its beautifully symmetrical rounded snow-capped top, Mount St. Helens was known for a long time, the Fujiyama of America. From a geologist's point of view, Mount St. Helens is young, at least younger than the other major Cascade volcanoes. The mountain is six miles across at its base, which is at an elevation of 4,400 feet on the northeastern side and 4,000 feet elsewhere. Before the 1980s, Mount St. Helens Peak rose more than 5,000 feet above its base. Another characteristic of this type of volcano is that they tend to erupt explosively and, for that reason, pose considerable danger to anything nearby. Mount St. Helens had previously been restless in the mid-19th century, when it was intermittently active from 1831 to 1857. However, after a major explosive eruption in 1800, the mountain gave little or no evidence of being a volcanic hazard for over a century. And for that reason, the beautiful Mount St. Helens has been a popular recreational area for hiking, camping, fishing, swimming, and boating. At the base of the volcano's northern flank, there is a lake called Spirit Lake. Not far from Spirit Lake, there is a gorge, nowadays called Ape Canyon, not to be confused with Ape Cave, one of the most spectacular hikes in the Mount St. Helens area. But it's not just the breathtaking nature that makes this area so interesting. 
but the fact that upon these steep, shallow cliffs, strange encounters have emerged over the past century. This gorge, along the edge of the Plains of Abraham on the southeast shoulder of Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington, was not always known as Abe Canyon. Not until the famous incident that took place in the narrow valley back in 1924, a group of miners alleged that they were attacked by a group of eight men. One of the miners present that day, Fred Beck, gave a personal account of the events 43 years after the incident. In July 1924, he was mining for gold at the Vander White, together with Gabe Leffer, John Peterson, Marion Smith, and Smith's son Roy. Fred began his story by saying, we had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area in southwest Washington. We had from time to time come across large tracks by creek beds and springs. In 1924, I and four other miners were working on our gold claim, the Vanda White. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens near a deep canyon, now named Ape Canyon, which was so named after an account of the incident reached the newspapers. During his account, Fred does not mention the real names of the other four men involved. Instead, he uses the name Hank of one of the main characters in the incident. Fred continues, Hank, a great hunter and good woodsman, was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large, and we knew that no known animal could have made them. The largest measured 19 inches long. By the middle of July, the group had received a good return on their claim and everybody was excited. So much so that when Fred got problems with one of his teeth and asked Hank to take him to the town to see a dentist, Hank refused, saying that God or the devil could not get him away from the gold mine. As Hank's Ford was the only way to get to the town, Fred just went back to the cabin in the north side of the canyon with a nagging toothache and a little appetite. Still, even though Hank was determined he still felt uneasy. They had been hearing noises in the evening around the cabin for about a week. Fred said, We would hear it coming from one ridge, and then hear an answering was whistling from another ridge. We also heard a sound which I could best describe as a booming or dumping sound, just like something was hitting himself on his chest. Then that one evening, Hank and Fred got a glimpse of the creature that was making all the noise. Hank asked his fellow miner to accompany him to the spring about 100 yards from their cabin to get some water. He suggested that they take some rifles to be on the safe side. As the two men then walked to the spring, Hank suddenly yelled and raised his rifle. Fred instantly saw what had scared him, a giant, hairy creature about 100 yards away on the other side of the little canyon, standing by a pine tree. When the creature poked its head out from the side of the tree, Hank shot three times. After each shot, Fred saw the bark fly. He also saw the creature, about seven feet tall with blackish hair, disappearing from their view for a moment before running away about 200 yards down the canyon. Fred shot three times too before the creature disappeared again. Afterward, Hank and Fred returned to the cabin with the water and told about the strange encounter to the rest of the miners. Everybody agreed they should go home the next morning. They would have left straight away, but it was already getting dark and it would not have been wise to get lost. And so, everybody made themselves as comfortable as they could in their pine cabin. As Fred said, We'd built a cabin ourselves and had made it very sturdy. It stood for years afterwards and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it was burned to the ground. Circumstances of the fire I don't recall. In the cabin, we had a long bunk bed in which two could sleep feet to feet. The rest of us were sleeping on pine boughs on the floor. At one end of the cabin, we had a fireplace fashioned out of rocks. There were no windows in the cabin, so darkness found all of us in the cabin more calm now. And my tooth was better somehow. The excitement seemed to work a temporary cure on it. 
We were sitting around puffing on pipes and talking about the trip home the next day. Each of us settled down to his crude but welcome bed and soon fell asleep. But they did not sleep for long. Around midnight, the men were woken by a tremendous thud against the cabin wall. Some of the chinking had been knocked loose from between the logs and fallen on Hank's chest, who was now yelling and kicking on the floor with his rifle in his hand. Fred helped to get the chinking off of him, and as Hank jumped to his feet, they heard a great commotion outside. Fred said, It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over a pile of our unused shakes. We grabbed our guns. Hank squinted through the space left by the chinking. By actual account, we saw only three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the start of the famous attack of which so much has been written in Washington and Oregon's papers throughout the years. According to Fred, many accounts tell of a giant boulder being hurled against the cabin and through the roof, but that is not what exactly happened. There were very few large rocks around the area, but it is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break the roof, but hit with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. That's not true. The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we'd quit shooting. Fred reasoned that if they only shot when they were attacked, maybe the creatures understood that they were only defending themselves. The miners would have had clear shots at the attackers through the opening left of the chinking, if they had chosen to shoot, that is. However, when the creatures climbed on top of the cabin, the men shot round after round through the roof. They were also pushing against the massive log door, making it vibrate from the impact. The miners answered by firing many rounds through the door, too. Fred continued. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over. But this was pretty much impossible. As previously stated, the cabin was a sturdy made building. Hank and I did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to the far end of the cabin, guns in their hands. The attack continued for a long time, for the remainder of the night. Fred remembers one of the most frightening moments being when one of the creatures reached its arm through the chinking space and seized one of the axes. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the logs. And at the same time, Hank's shots barely missing my hand, the creature let go, and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place. A humorous thing I will remember was Hank singing, If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, and we'll all go home in the morning. He didn't mean it to be humorous, for Hank was dead serious, and saying under the impression that the mountain devil, as he called him, might understand and go away. Finally, just before daylight, the attack ended. Fred and Hank came out of the cabin very cautiously. Seeing one of the ape-like creatures standing at about 80 yards away near the edge of the Ape Canyon, Fred shot a few times, and the creature disappeared into the gorge. At this point, Hank had had enough. He said it was better for all of them to just leave, not even properly pack their equipment. They just needed to go. It was better to lose their stuff than to lose their lives. Needless to say, everybody agreed. Fred's account continues. We left about $200 in supplies, powder, and drilling equipment behind. I tried to persuade everyone not to relate the happenings to anyone, and they agreed. But Hank soon let the cat out of the bag. We made our way to Spirit Lake, and Hank went into the ranger station. He told the ranger earlier about the tracks, and the ranger had replied, Let me know if you find out what they are. That was just what Hank did to the puzzlement of the ranger. When the men were back home, the story of the eight-man attack quickly leaked out to the papers. Local reporters interviewed anyone involved, and soon, the great ape hunt of 1924 was on. People flocked to Mount St. Helens looking for the creatures that had attacked the five miners that July night. Fred also returned at the scene with two reporters and a detective from Portland, Oregon. We found large tracks, and they photographed them. We did not see any of the ape men then, nor could we find the ones we had shot. Some people were asking questions. 
Was it true or was it just a wild tale? I can assure you it is true that they are human, animal, or devils. But what exactly are the ape men? Alleged observation of Bigfoot, also commonly referred to as Sasquatch, go way back. The British explorer David Thompson is sometimes credited with the first discovery of a set of Sasquatch footprints in 1811. Since then, many visual sightings and even alleged photographs and filmings have appeared during the years, but none of the evidence has been verified. Still, Many indigenous cultures across the North America continent include some kind of tales of mysterious creatures living in the forest. So Bigfoot legends have existed long before modern day reports. Often, Bigfoot is described as a large muscular ape-like creature, roughly six to nine feet tall and covered in black, brown, or dark reddish hair. Common descriptions also include long arms, broad shoulders, and no visible neck. And of course, enormous feet, like the creature's name hints. Bigfoot's footprints are claimed to be as large as 24 inches long at 8 inches wide. Some have even claimed they've been close enough to smell the creature, like the owner of the Bigfoot Discovery Museum, Michael Rugg, who described the smell as follows. Imagine a skunk that had rolled around in dead animals and had hung around the garbage pits. There have been more than 10,000 reported Sasquatch sightings in the continental United States, many of them located in the Pacific Northwest, with the remaining reports spread throughout the rest of North America. To give some examples, according to data collected from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization's Bigfoot Sightings Database in 2019, Washington has over 2,000 reported sightings, California over 1,600, Pennsylvania over 1,300, New York and Oregon over 1,000, and Texas has just over 800. So people claiming they've seen Bigfoot is not that rare of recurrence. But while many say they believe these creatures actually live in the forest, many others argue that the sightings are just hoaxes, or people misidentifying other animals, such as bears, wolves, or coyotes as Bigfoot. And that also happened after the 1924 incident. Not everybody was convinced of Fred's story about what had taken place around the remote cabin on one summer night. Rangers J.H. Huffman and William Welch were the ones who hiked into the forest with Fred, who took them to the cliff where they had shot one of the ape men, but they found nothing. They then continued to the cabin, where Fred pointed out the large stones the miners claimed were used in the attack. However, J.H. and William thought that Fred and others could have placed the rocks there themselves. When William and J.H. returned to Kelso, Washington, an Argonian reporter asked them about the 14-inch long footprints found near the cabin. But again, the two men were skeptical, saying that the print could have been created using the knuckles and palm of a human being. Almost 60 years after the incident, in 1983, William Halliday, director of the Western Speleological Survey, claimed in his pamphlet, Ape Cave and the Mount St. Helens Apes, that it had actually been local youth who had attacked the miners. Back then, before the events of 1980, counselors from the YMCA's Camp Mehan on nearby Spirit Lake used to bring hikers to the canyon's edge. So some believe that it was young campers who were throwing the stones into the canyon for fun, not realizing that the miners had a cabin there. During the nighttime, it would have been almost impossible for Fred and his friends to see what dark figures attacking them actually were. In addition, The narrow walls of the canyon could have possibly distorted the voices to sound way more frightening than they really were. However, despite many trying to debunk the Ape Canyon story, people still wanted to believe, and the tale continued to spread. The Oregonian reported, Friends and acquaintances of the five men who reported their experiences are of the belief that they actually saw something which cannot be explained. In addition, Cowlitz tribe member Frank Wanasei told a reporter about creatures the tribe's elders had often spoken about, saying that they were between 9 and 10 feet tall, correspondingly large in stature, and their bodies covered with long hair. These creatures were never seen during the day, only at night. And then, of course, 
There was the mysterious disappearance of Jim Carter in 1950, which was reported in the Oregon Journal by Marge Davenport in August 1963. Part of the story reads as follows. Carter's complete disappearance is an unsolved mystery to this day, declared Bob Lee, a well-known Portland mountaineer. Dr. Otto Trott, Lee Stark, and I finally came to the conclusion that the apes got him, said Lee seriously. On the way down the mountain, he left the other climbers at a landmark called Dog's Head at the 8,000 feet level. He told them he would ski around to the left and take a picture of the group as they skied down to Timberline. That was the last anyone saw of Carter. The next morning, searchers found a discarded film box at the point where he had taken a picture. From here, Carter evidently took off down the mountain, a wild, death-defying dash, taking chances that no skier of his caliber would take unless something was terribly wrong or he was being pursued. He jumped over two or three large crevices and evidently was going like the devil. When Carter's tracks reached the precipice side of the Ape Canyon, the searchers were amazed to see that Carter had been in such a hurry that he went right down the steep canyon walls. But they didn't find him at the bottom. We combed the canyon, one into the other, for five days. Sometimes there were as many 75 people in the search party. After two weeks, the search was called off. Bob, who was the leader of the 1961 Himalayan expedition, has said he never saw the apes. But there was something strange on the high slopes of the mountain. According to Bob, the search for Jim Carter was the eeriest experience he had ever had. He said that every time he was cut off from the rest of the search party, he felt somebody was watching me. It definitely did not look like Jim had taken off down the mountain, running as fast as he could. But why did someone or something pursue him? And how did Jim completely disappear from the face of the earth just after his tracks went to the direction of Ape Canyon? Fred Beck eventually wrote a book in 1967 about his and the four other miners' experience in Ape Canyon. In this book, Fred gives a little different kind of view of what exactly he thinks the ape-like creatures that attacked them were. First of all, I'll say that they are not entirely of the world. I know the reaction we experienced as these beings attacked our cabin impressed many with the concept of great ape-like men dwelling in the mountains. And I can say that we genuinely fought and were quite fearful, and we were glad to get out of the mountains. But I was, for one, always conscious that we were dealing with supernatural beings, and I know the other members of the party felt the same. Fred continued by saying events leading up to the incident were filled with a psychic element. Even the method of how they found the mine was psychic. Fred explained, In 1922, we found the location of our mine. A spiritual being, a large Indian dressed in buckskin, appeared to us and talked to us. He was the picture of stateliness itself. He never told us his name, but we always called him the Great Spirit. He replied once, The Great Spirit is above me. We are all of the Great Spirit if we listen when the Great Spirit talks. Apparently, these spiritual beings showed the five men the location of the mine with a white arrow. Fred said that they started by the Lewis River, south of Mount St. Helens, and went up the Muddy River. And in all, they followed the white arrow four days before they finally found what they were looking for. For the next six years, everything was peaceful. We were simple men and hard-working men, and an aura of good or spiritual power surrounded us. We had seen the tracks, but the makers of them had left us alone. No one was really worried about the tracks as regarding any threat to our safety, but after one of us had lost his temper and denounced the spirit leading us a liar, from that time on a quiet apprehensiveness settled over us. The five men continued working their claim, but they began to feel uneasy. Then, they started to hear the strange noises, the same thudding, hollow thumping noise that they heard at night preceding the attack, but they never saw anything. To which Fred commented, 
There's no doubt in my mind that these beings were present and observing us, but they had not yet appeared in physical form. Another unnatural experience happened one day when Hank came back to their tent rather excited. He led us to the moist sand bar and took us almost to the center. There in the center of the sandbar were two huge tracks about four inches deep. There was not another track on that sandbar. There we were standing in the middle of the sandbar and not one of us could conceive any earthly thing taking steps 160 feet long. No human being could have made these tracks, Hank said, and there's only one way they could be made. Something dropped from the sky and went back up. In the end, Fred came to a conclusion that the abominable snowmen are from a lower plane. When the condition and vibration are at a certain frequency, they can easily, for a time, appear in a very solid body. They're not animal spirits, but also lack the intelligence of human consciousness. When reading about evolution, we've read many times conjecture about the missing link between man and the anthropoid ape. The snowmen are a missing link in consciousness neither animal nor human. They are very close to our dimension, and yet are a part of one lower. Could they be the missing link man has been so long searching for? I've lived this experience with abominable snowmen. I've encountered them on the slopes of Mount St. Helens. I have looked deep into myself to tell you of their nature. I've had both the earthly experience of encountering them by Ape Canyon and the spiritual experience of knowing and telling what they are. Fred's account is fascinating, and the 1924 Ape Canyon attack remains one of the most well-known Bigfoot incidences, but it is definitely not the only one that has happened on the shoulder of Mount St. Helens. In 1974, Oregonian reporter Anita Nygaard wrote, Since then, tracks have been sighted on the Lewis River, attested to by rational and honest witnesses, occasional campers, and motorists have been startled by glimpses of huge and mysterious hairy creatures walking like men, disappearing into the woods. Then, 56 years after Fred and the other miners had woken up to the Bigfoot attack, Mount St. Helen also woke up and showed its destructive power on May 18, 1980. The eruption, which killed more than four dozen people, as well as thousands of wild animals. But what happened to Bigfoot? stuck in the mud, they had jeeps and things that they were trying to pull out of, uh, uh, pull these big uh, uh, cows, and cows and horses and things out of the mud. We got had time to come back here later and uh, to look at things like this. You could notice the species of animals that were drinking from uh, water and the species would be uh, uh, alien and you wouldn't think that they would uh, have a ha habitat or habit the area together and you, you see deer and bear the elk and uh, enemies the species they're drinking right together that's it's almost like they reacted like we did yeah i talked to yeah exactly i talked to somebody about it and he said there there were some uh, interesting theories that have been uh, propounded as a result of that nature suffers such a catastrophic uh, trauma that the, it will let down the natural laws of separation and, uh, to, in order to allow each species to propagate itself again.